reading in Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Yes. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. Lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones of the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. <clears throat> now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life. And bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. Don't forget that word, patience. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. It's holy. It's life-giving. It instructs us in the important things of life on this earth. And in the one to come, it will continue on and not fall to the ground. Thank you. Father, would you please now open every ear, open every heart, and cement in us the desire to put the things of God into practice in our lives in every respect so that we may see a great harvest in the days to come in our lives, the lives of our families, and the lives of those within our church. We pray these things and far more, exceedingly abundantly more in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So the subtitle this morning is The Sower. Jesus gave this message of the sower and some of the other parables from a boat. So he got in a boat, he borrowed a boat, and he launched out a little bit, and the people had come from all of the cities. And there were thousands of people there gathered on the seashore. I learned a hard lesson many years ago, and I'm talking about more than 30 years ago. It was my first trip to Canada on a fishing expedition. And uh, we were all Christians, all believers, and friends. But we had a squall that came upon that large lake up in Canada. And it blew us off the lake for a couple of days. And we had no distractions there, you know. There was no TV, there was no anything to distract us, but... If you stay 24-7 with some people, especially people you're not used to being with, there's a tendency to start getting on each other's nerves. <laughs> Believe me. And so I remember my friend and I, we were getting along, but the other two were getting on our nerves. And when the, when the squall finally died down, we were out on the lake, and the two boats one with my friend and me and the other two and another boat were, I would say, I don't know, a few hundred yards apart. And that day, my friend and I were, we were just in our 20s, uh, as I recall. But we were a little disgruntled about the other two guys in the other boat. And we were talking in just a very normal conversational voice. We were talking about the other two in the other boat. 
Well, I learned a really valuable lesson that day. Our friends in the boat, because of the water reflecting our voice and amplifying our voice, they were hearing everything that we were saying. And you can't imagine the embarrassment that we had when our friends in the other boat started laughing and started repeating all the things we had said about them. What could we do? But just turn red and accept the consequences of that. Well, Jesus is very smart, you know. He, he pushes out in the boat, and he didn't have a PA system. He didn't have an ampli, ampli, uh, ampli, amplifier, application, whatever, system. Yeah, I didn't have any of that, so he launched out and let the water amplify his voice and reach out to the people. And so by the thousands, they could hear him clearly. And he's speaking in terms of a parable, which is kind of like an allegory, or maybe you could call it a metaphor, given something that they could understand in the natural in order that he might further explain something that's in the spiritual. That was the parable. The players in this story were the seed, which he very plain to say the seed, that the sower, which is the next player, was sowing is the word of God, just, just like I'm doing right now. I am the sower. And what I'm sowing into your lives and into your hearts right now is God's word. Well, he was doing it that day to thousands in a wholesale fashion. So you've got the seed, the sower, and that could be me, it could be any Christian, any believer, sowing God's word into someone's life. Then you have the devil. He always manages to sneak in there somewhere, right? If he can. And then you have the four grounds. And the four grounds are the four types of people that are hearing the Word of God and having the Word of God sown into their lives. The ones that are good here, the things that we can acknowledge and attribute to goodness are the seed. You know that God's Word is good and beneficial. The sower is good because he is in righteousness doing the work of God, sowing the good news into people's lives. And then there is the devil. We know he's evil. And then there's the four grounds, and one of the four types of ground is good and beneficial. This parable in the day and time it was given, in the first century, about 30 A.D., 30 years after the birth of Christ, this was a very contemporary story. This was one that was easy for the people of that generation to understand because it was a largely agrarian society and culture. Most people made their living through and off of the land, sowing seed, harvesting, enough to feed their family, enough to sell, and so they could have money to get the other things that they needed above and beyond food, like clothing and housing and so on. So they understood this in the sense of what he was trying to say. They understood the agrarian lifestyle. They understood that when you put seed into the ground, hopefully it would grow uh, properly and you would reap a harvest in order to eat, in order to live. And so the sower here is walking over the fields. If you can visualize this. See, they, they did things differently than they do today. Today, we've got these monster tractors and these monster implements, you know, that, that can uh, just take hundreds and hundreds of acres and just, you know, plow and plant and all of that and reap and cultivate and all of that. Monster, some of these large... Farming enterprises are just amazing. The volume 
and the quickness that they do these things. But back in the old, it was done very differently. You would have the sower, and he would have a bag of sorts with, you know, with, with a handle, and he would hang it over his head and would have a, a, a good-sized bag in front of him. And in it would be seed, whether it be wheat seed or corn or whatever. And he would walk up and down the field, and he would take handfuls of corn or wheat, whatever it might be, and he would just spread it out like this, right over the top of the hard ground. And he'd take another seed, and he would just spread it out like that. He didn't cultivate, he, he didn't plow first. In those days, today, we plow first, then we plant, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a way of doing things today. But in those days, they didn't. They would, they would throw the seed out, and then they would come in, and they would plow the seed and in the essence of that, they would take the seed and they would bury it. Now, in the process of doing that, there was some waste. There was some that landed in areas that maybe he really didn't intend for it to land, but he's just scattering it. And he's landing some on ground. There's some soil there, maybe a, just a very thin layer of soil. But of no depth, and right below it, there would be rock hard. Other seed would land where people had uh, maybe had sown. The Bible uses another parable about how Satan comes in. Satan comes in and he sows weeds at night when no one's aware of it. He sows weeds. I heard about that actually happening in Canada one time years ago that an angry farmer wanting to get vengeance went to a neighbor's farm one night and he sold something called daisy seed, which is a really, uh, it's a weed that grows up and it just chokes the life off of, uh, and so to this day, generations later, they still haven't been able to rid the fields of that daisy seed that that man planted there generations ago. And this is what Satan does. Yes, he's wicked. And some of that seed would land in that where the, the, the weeds are laying dormant now, but they're, gonna, they're there to spring up around the good seed and choke it off, the Bible says. Today we're just going to focus on two of the grounds that Jesus mentioned. One is the one that was planted with thorns and weeds. And the other one was the good ground that brought forth a harvest. Let's talk about the weedy ground first, the reedy heart. Let me go back to that verse 14 and read that again about the weeds and the seed that fell among them. It said, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they've heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Have you ever seen a believer like that? There's just no fruit in their life whatsoever. Why? Because the things of culture, the things of this world have just choked the life right out of them. I thought about that word choked. You know, all of us are going to die someday, and we don't always get to choose how we die. But one thing I would hope is that I would never die of choking to death. To me, that's one of the most violent and horrible ways to die. It's to be choked to death. When I was thinking of that, what came to mind was something that happened that I was aware of Many years ago, early in my secular business, I had a client, a woman who, uh, for all appearances, was a really fine and outstanding and upstanding Christian. A woman that, man, she knew just what to say and how to say it, and she had all of this language down and jargon down, and... Um, she brought her mother, her elderly mother, to me and said, Mom needs some help, you know, investing her money and so on. And, 
And I thought, wow, this gal, she's incredible. She, she really loves her mom, and, and she's trying to do the best. He's taking care of her. And I was unduly, I was, I was in, impressed with her. And uh, a little bit after that, a few weeks, a few months, one day I got a call from one of the family members of this woman. And they said, sister has died. And I went, what? What happened? I just saw her recently. Said she was eating some food and she was in a kitchen and something went down the wrong way and, and she choked to death. And, you know, I was just so stunned and devastated about this. And so the family came from all over. And as they gathered, and I was expressing my condolences right and left, I don't remember how it came out, but they found out that this woman was living a double life. She was living one life, going to church, looking and trying to live like a saint, but there was a dark side to her life. And she was carrying on affairs with married men, she was stealing money from her family. She had been stealing money, taking money out of her mother's account and spending it on her own pleasures. And I remember that family, in, in an instant, they changed from a family that was grieving and saddened, and they became a family that was grievously hurt and angry. I just remember what a tremendous dichotomy that was of, of what we thought she had been versus what we come to find out she had been doing and how she had been living. I wondered, you know, she choked to death and there's something in that that's figurative, you know, to what she was spiritually doing, but somehow she had let the enemy come into her field. And in fast the field that God's word had been sown into her life and the weeds of the field had just grown up around her and they had choked off her life in the areas of just reading that per se again. When they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and they bring no fruit to maturity. Could we stop right here and pray? Father, right now, Father, I don't have to tell you, but I'll say it for a witness. That I've laid myself out, Father, to hear a message from you that will be beneficial and a blessing, Lord, to every soul in this house. I just come against the enemy that is trying to distract some in this house. That is enabling the enemy to come in and deter them from hearing the word of God and receiving the seed into their lives. And so in Jesus' name, come against any enemy trying to sow weeds into our congregation and to the individual souls in this house, Lord. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Will you agree with me and say amen? Amen. amen. Thank you. The cares of this world. In Mark 4.19, it's the same parable, but it's a... A little bit more descriptive of what I'm talking about. It says, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. The deceitfulness of riches. How so? How can riches be deceitful? Riches can deceive you. 
in the sense that it will try to convince you that money and material things and all of that can buy you happiness. We've got a very strong force out there that comes off the streets of New York City called Madison Avenue and everything it does is trying to make you uncomfortable and trying to make you dissatisfied and unsatisfied with what you have and what you have in life. And there's this lie that's perpetrated that's saying, if you have this, if you have more money, if you have more things, it can buy you happiness. And it can provide you security. And it can give you fulfillment. But how many of you have discovered that that's not true? It's a lie. It just doesn't operate that way when it comes right down to where the rubber meets the road. And so we get inclined when these weeds are in our life and they're growing up and they're sapping the nutrients out of the soil. It's a good soil except for the weeds. That which should be coming into us and bringing fruit into our lives. These things get into our lives. This desire for money, desire for things, desire for the materialistic things of this world. And then we become willing to neglect the things of God. Amen. Willing to neglect the things of God. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people have, I probably should put that into the millions, have quit going to church altogether. Why? Because, remember a friend of mine, I've said this before, had been such a faithful churchgoer for so long, and then I noticed that he wasn't going to church anymore. I said, hey, where, where are you going to church? He said, man, I go every Sunday morning, I go to St. Mattress. I'd never heard that term before. I said, he said, I'm right in my bed, brother. Giving up. Church isn't important. Thousands of people are doing that all the time and saying, there's no need. I've got other things. Like the woman that told me one time said she couldn't come to the Sunday school class in the summer because she had a boat. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with boats. There's nothing wrong. (laughs) When when they're used in their proper perspective. I consider it a blessing. But it's a curse if that thing is keeping you from being in the house of God. Nancy and I crossed over the Kalamazoo River this morning. And we always look to see if there's any cars in the parking lot. And often there is. And there was four pickup trucks in the parking lot this morning. Man, it was 33 degrees and raining when we crossed over this morning. I said to Nancy, I said, listen. I said, I would to God that Christians would be as faithful as those fishermen. That Christians would love being in the house of God as much as those guys love to be on that water. I mean, Lord, you would have to love it. To me, to me, it'd be a penalty, a punishment. Because I don't love it that much. But I'll go through hell and high water to get to church. Because I love it. I love it. And God forbid that we neglect together together. And for some, it's because we determine, we decide, we prefer, I suppose, in cases to work on Sundays instead of putting the kingdom of God first, as in Matthew 6, This is something I've had to deal with. Back when I was in my 20s, I was working for um, Meyer Corporation. I tell you, Fred Meyer was a good businessman. Nice, nice man. Met him, nice man. But I can tell you one thing. He had no use for the things of the church. And he had no use accommodating his employees for getting off on Sunday morning to go to church. And I was working 
uh, in management for them back in those days. And I remember the powers that be, the store manager came up to me and said, and by the way, you will work at least, I think he said, one out of every three Sundays. I said, hmm, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. So I couldn't abide by that. And so my third week would come around. You didn't see Doyle. If you wanted to see Doyle, you came to church. I'd walk in on Monday and say, hey, I didn't see you around here. I said, no, I was in church. Well, don't you know? <laughs> I've told you the story before, and you that have heard it a hundred times, forgive me, and let me just tell it to the people that have never heard this, because about half of this congregation never heard this. In that same job, there was one night per year on a Friday night, and it was mandatory that every uh, every manager would be at this Friday night annual party in all the stores in the district. All of the managers would be there, mandatory. They came to me and they said, "We want." I said, what goes on there? I said, well, first of all, we get kind of loaded up in the parking lot. Yeah. And then we go in and we dance and we do this and we drink and we fight and all kinds of things break out and that's pretty much all, everything that happens. I went home and I had an office in the basement down by the furnace at that time over on 10th Street. And I went down there and I got down on my knees. I said, God, I don't want to go to this thing. I said, Lord, what do you want? He said, don't go. He said, I'll take care of you. I said, deal. So I went back and I said, I'm not coming. They said, you better come. It's mandatory. If you don't, you could lose your job. I said, so be it. So the following Monday, I came in, and there were, my, there were my co-workers, and they were waiting for me at the door, all grins. And they said, Doyle, we noticed you weren't there on Friday night. Did you know you were the only one in the whole district that didn't show up? You stood out like a sore thumb. I said, did I? Well, good. The district manager was there that day, and he only came through ever so often, but he was there that morning. And I saw him, but I avoided him. And finally, he caught up with me about mid-morning. And he called me over and said, Doyle, come here a minute. His name was Dan. And Dan looked at me and he said, Doyle, you weren't there on Friday night. I saw that. I said, yes, sir. He said, you know that was a mandatory meeting. I said, that's what I understand. He said, Doyle, I'm being told around here that you weren't there because of your religious convictions. Is that correct? I said, that is exactly correct. And I could see my cohorts, they were gathered around on an end cap, at the end of an end cap, and they were all like this, ready to hear the boom be lowered on me. And he said, Doral, I just want you to know something. And this was, this was not a Christian man by any means, quite the contrary. But he looked at me and he said, you know what? I love that kind of integrity. And he said, we need more of that around here. He said, it's guys like you that I can use in this company and that we can right. elevate and promote. And he said, oh, by the way, I hear you've been getting a little bit of hassle by some of your coworkers. Is that correct? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I just want anybody to know that anybody that says one more word to Doyle will be terminated on the spot. Whoa. I walked away from there feeling pretty good about things. But I can tell you, I was ready to give up that job. I needed that job. I was working three jobs. I was working almost night and day, and Nancy was working besides in order to raise our family, just getting by at that time. I needed that job. I needed the insurance and everything that came with it. But I knew that God would not forsake me if I would put the kingdom of God first. Say, well, my job, it requires, get another job. You don't think of all the jobs out there that God can provide you with a better job than the one that you just came off, one that has no more respect for you than to make you work on Sundays? I feel, that's the way I feel about things. Amen? Praise God. I regarded my spiritual life more 
than my physical life. To do anything less than that is to fall under the prophecy that Haggai chapter 1 verse 6 gave where it says you earn wages to be put into a bag with holes. Things and pleasures And to finance them, to finance those things, we are willing, we can be willing to shortchange God so that we may live our lifestyle. It's a bad trade. My first job out of college, I was 21, 22 years old. My first job paid $100 a week. Nancy and I were pretty newly married, both just out of college, had college bills and, you know, just trying to make a living. But I sat Nancy down and I said, okay, honey, my check is $100 a week. Here's what I need you to do. Every week, get the checkbook out. And thank God she's been responsible for the bills our whole life. I never complain about that anything that she does anymore because she's threatened to let me have it. <laughs> and so I just say, no, 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 everything looks good. Everything's fine, honey. You just keep doing a good job. So after 40 years, she's still doing it, 40 some. Right. But I'd say, honey, take a check out and write it out for $10 because that's going to the Lord. Yeah. Now let me ask you something. Do you think perhaps in obedience to God as we obey him because he has said this. This is very clear. This isn't something Doyle's making up. This is something that's replete throughout the Bible from beginning to end and that is to tithe. And a tithe, we all know, is one-tenth. So on $100, that was easy math for me. $10. And when that got increased, you know, to $200, well, that was easy too. 500, it became easy, just as easy. Came into, became practiced in that. I started when I was a little boy. Why? Because I had a godly mother. When I earned my first dollar, she said, now, Dora, let me teach you about tithing. She said, anytime you earn a dollar, God wants you to take a dime of that and put it in the offering and sow that into God's kingdom. I said, okay, Mom, I'll do that. And from that high, I started doing that, and I've, I've never failed to do it to my knowledge. Many times I round up my tithes just in case there was ever a time I forgot. Not that this is some legalistic thing that I follow through. I just want to be, I want to, I want to do the things of God. I want to follow his instruction. The tithe is to 10%, but not just any 10%. It's not the last 10%. It's not what's left over. It's the first 10%. That's God's ways in the kingdom of God. And it's perfect. And it works. Never failing. Now the early church in the first century, keep this in mind, before Christianity, which didn't start until about 30 A.D., and then it just bloomed, but before Christianity, the, the first day of the week, the first business day of the week was Sunday. Okay? So the Jews, the pagans, and everybody in between, they started their work week on Sunday. And then Christianity came along, and a whole new breed of people were birthed. They decided back then, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Sunday would not be a work day. But they would take that and they would sacrifice that to God. And so while their pagan friends and their Jewish, non-believing Christian friends were starting off on Sunday and they were going out there and they were selling and they were farming and they were opening their stores and, you know, working their looms or whatever they had. While they were doing all that, they said, we're going to tithe our time to the Lord. And the first day of the week, we're going to gather together. And we're not going to work. We're going to rest. And we're just going to receive from the Lord that day his blessings. 
And that's how it's been ever since. For 2,000 years now. That's how it's been. It's time that first day of the week. And then we've got six days to work. And we followed that through for centuries. And today it seems like we've gotten back into that old thing where anything goes on Sunday. Some of you were raised in days when that wasn't the case. Your neighbor didn't get his mower out on Sunday. I used to didn't think anything about that at all when I first came up here. I said, what's the big deal? The guy mows his lawn on Sunday afternoon. What do I care? Until one day I was sitting in my backyard and I was resting and relaxing one Sunday afternoon and my, no, and my neighbor got the mower started. I just remember that grating on my nerves so bad. I thought, I'm here. I've worked, I've worked every day this week. Couldn't you have done that on Saturday? Couldn't you have done that on Friday? Wasn't there another time you could have done that? Because I'm here resting and I'm relaxed. We need a day when we can just get away and relax and rest. Somebody say, man, I know I'm not the only one that believes this. They gave the first day. See, the tithe is the first. Now, I've talked about the weedy field. Let me finish this out talking about our goal, and that is to be the good field. In Luke 8, verse 8, this is when he gave the original parable to the people. The part I read earlier was the explanation of that to the disciples because even they couldn't figure it out, and he had to explain it more clearly to them. But in verse 8, it said, And others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Wow. The good ground. See, we are the ground. We're either good ground or we're weedy ground or we're rocky ground or, or something else. But he said, if you'll do this, you'll allow your life to be good ground to receiving of the seed. He said, I'm going to bless your life. Not tenfold, which was the normal return back in those days. Not thirtyfold, not just sixty, but he said there, 100 times, I'm going to bless your life. Do you believe God is able to do that? I know he is because I've seen him do it. I saw him do it in the 26th chapter of Genesis in the life of Isaac. There's a scripture over there in 26. 12 and 13, it says, Then Isaac sold in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. The man, which is Isaac, began to prosper. And he continued prospering until he became very prosperous. The Bible talks in John 15 about the seed and about the grapes, about the vine. And he talks about Fruit. Then he talks about more fruit. And then he talks about greater fruit. That's what I want. I don't want a tenfold blessing. I don't want a thirtyfold blessing. I don't want a sixtyfold. I want a hundredfold blessing. Why not? He gave it to Isaac. He gave it to Isaac, and Isaac wasn't even born again. Isaac wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost. Those things had not happened yet. I'm born again. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm walking in truth. I've got the Word of God that I can pick up and read and hear and sow in my life and other people's lives any time of the day. And I love this Word. Enjoy it. Question should be asked, why did God bless Abraham? Why did God bless his son, Isaac? It's clear. Again, there in, Rev in Gen uh, Genesis chapter 26. Let me read this to you and we'll bring this thing to a close. 26, 4, and 5. 
This is God speaking to Abraham. He said, and I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Verse 5 says, it gives you the answer. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. There's just something about doing it God's way. And when we do it God's way, he puts a blessing over us. Some of you are brand new Christians, perhaps. You say, well, I didn't know about this doctrine. I didn't know I was supposed to do it. It's not too late to start. Start it. If possible, before you leave this house. Some time ago, I had a sister that was having a whole lot of issues in her life. I mean, bowled down with, with issues. I asked her one day, I said, hey, I don't, I don't get this. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And I just, I said, are you, are you, are you giving your tithes? Because I didn't know. I don't know who gives what. I said, are you giving your tithes? Well, no. I said, why not? I can't afford it. I said, you can't afford it. And, and she said, I feel so embarrassed. That when everybody else is bringing their money up, I've got nothing to bring up. I said, wait, wait. I said, you don't have to be embarrassed. I said, can you come up with a dollar? Can you just start it and find a dollar? And she said, no. I don't have a dollar. It almost made me mad, she said it. I thought, wait a minute. If I didn't have a dollar... You drop me off at the highway out here in 15 minutes, I'll have 10 pop cans in my little plastic bag, and I'll go to Meyer and I'll cash those in, and I will have a dollar in my pocket. Give me 15 minutes on that highway. I said, you telling me you can't get 10 pop cans together and go cash them in and bring a dollar to the Lord. No, I can't do that. Listen. When you continue to defy God's plan for your life and his instructions to you in his word, when you stick a finger in his eye, and I can tell you her life since that time has just gotten worse and worse and worse. You think, I don't know, I'm not saying there's a connection. But I wonder if maybe there's not. If one connects to the other. Luke 11 and 28 says, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You remember when that was happened? Jesus was walking along and this well-meaning lady jumped out from the crowd and said, Blessed is the woman who bore you. And he looked at her and said, More blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. (laughs) Listen, it's like two plus two equals four. It's that simple. Walk in truth. Walk in the word. Walk in obedience to it. As God gives you the ability, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. I I have found that out. I knew it was true, but I have found it out experientially. And it's a good thing. Many of you have too. You know what I'm talking about. Praise God. God's promises are yes and amen. Isn't it interesting how many times they come with a connective requirement? Would you stand this morning? Hallelujah. I don't know how this hit everybody. Uh, Only God knows. But I can tell you one thing. This message was not preached in a flippant way. And it wasn't prepared in a flippant way.
I may not be the best communicator, and I'm certainly not the most diplomatic. All I pretty much know how to do is just say, here's the truth, walk in it, and if you do, you'll be blessed. That's about all I know. But it's worked for me, and it's worked for others. And I pray that you, that each one of us will continue to allow it to work in us and not grow weary in well-doing. The seed doesn't come up instantly. It's a long time sometimes. I know out here in the in Hamilton area, they sold the seed, the winter seed, uh, the winter wheat. They sell that, I think, in the fall, don't they, Marge, yeah. before winter comes. That doesn't come up till the following spring. It just lays there dormant until the warmth of the sun hits it. And then here comes a crop. Isn't that something? Yeah. Planted that last fall. <laughs> Praise God. Will you bow your heads with me? I hope you'll come into agreement with me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, first of all, thank you, God, for the many, many blessings we have of all sorts, of health and material blessings and so on, Father. God, we want to be grateful in that. And we want to be obedient, Lord, in that that which is given unto us, that first Tenth, Lord, that's yours. And God forbid we touch that. And we know in doing so, Lord, we will receive a blessing. You said in Malachi 3, he said, it'd be a blessing so of such magnitude, you will not be able to hold it. It's going to overflow into other people's lives. Thank you for that, Lord. It's one thing for me to receive a gift. I have found it to be of even greater worth to give a gift. And I thank you for that, Lord, for the truth of that. And your upside-down kingdom, or is it this world that's upside down? Thank you, God. I pray, Lord, you would speak to every one of our hearts, and we would, in obedience, follow your words specifically specifically and implicitly. Hey, God, from it, we shall be blessed and walk in blessing. So, Lord, now bless the people. Stay with them as they go, Lord. Keep your hands over them. Keep your hands over them. And bless as they go. In Jesus' name, I pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.